Fadi Ghandour is the quintessential entrepreneur. Fadi is famous as the founder of Aramex. He has now reinvented himself as the executive chairman of Wanda Ventures, a new VC fund focusing on technology investments in the Arab world. Amongst his other notable roles and positions that he holds currently includes the managing partner of Mina Venture Investors, board member of Abraj Capital and Endeavor Global. He's on the advisory council of MIT's Media Lab, a board of trustees at the American University of Beirut, founding investor of Maktoud.com in 1999, which was subsequently sold to Yahoo in 2009 and started the digital revolution in the region. He's also the chairman of Rawad, an equity-based fund for micro-businesses and micro-entrepreneurs. He is a graduate from George Washington University. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the second most difficult segment of the day because we, Fadi and I are between you and lunch. So we have to make it really, really exciting to make this thing happen. It is, uh, I know everybody says this, but I think I mean this from deep from my heart uh, with, with humility and gratitude. I have known Fadi for many, many years, and uh, he is a true icon. He is a true business leader. A lot of people here are successful, and many of them in this room and many outside. But success is measured not just by numbers, but it's measured by contribution, is measured by sustainability, is measured by a future vision, is measured by commitment. But even more than all of those things is measured by character. He is humble, he is authentic, he is real. He is a very, very special man. Could you please give him a big round of applause to start this thing? Now you have to live Thank up you. to all of this. I'm, 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 I'm going to try. <laughs> Absolutely. Depends on the questions. The questions are easy. We sometimes, I see you as a revolutionary, as an activist, as somebody who's ready to shake, shake the tree. Do you see yourself like that? Absolutely. Um, it would be boring. I would have a boring life if I didn't think that I was like that. No, I, look, uh, revolutionary in the sense that uh, I kept my, my, uh, my very innocent uh, and sometimes stupid habits of a, of a, of a naughty boy, if you want. Yeah. Uh, so I questioned a lot of things. I refused authority consistently. Yeah. I... Uh, I like to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, you know, revolutionary in the sense that uh, I thought things could be done better also. Uh, but I ended up being an evolutionary person. Indeed. Uh, so and you... I, I, didn't, I didn't revolutionize anything. I, I just had fun doing whatever I was doing. But you're changing the, uh, the landscape. You're changing the startup landscape. Uh, you're inspiring young people through your activism and through your, your, your authentic uh, uh, effort in this space? So I'm, I'm a believer that you, uh, role models are essential, and uh, role models have a job uh, to actually go out and, and uh, shake things up. You have a duty to do whatever you're doing, specifically if you have actually uh, well, felt that you have achieved something, that you have a message, that you have a story to tell. Uh, people get inspired by, the, by it. Uh, people think, if he's done it, I can do it. Uh, so I always urge people in general, and I that's why I sit on many panels, because I feel that you need to actually go out and tell the story and tell it in a simplified manner and show that it actually is not that difficult. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, there is, you need to humanize and bring everything down to earth so that uh, the next generation can actually think that uh, they can actually go out and do whatever they need to do. What is the essence of your story? You started uh, with very humble beginnings. You built a multi-billion so dollar business. So the business started from humble beginnings. I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not your typical entrepreneur from rags to riches. So I, I come from a well-to-do family. So I'm blessed. Okay. Uh, that, that gives you a massive advantage so, so that we are clear on it. Uh, uh, there are people that have done much better from, from uh, much humbler, uh, uh, if you want, uh, backgrounds. Uh, so I, was, I, I came from, from a, a sense of security. 
uh, but the business started from scratch. Yeah. And uh, Aramex, that is, and I spent 35 years in it, effectively. Yeah. I'm still on the board today. And uh, it became a global company, and um, it, it went public two times. Yes. Um, so it's, I've, so did you I've, go did I've done things that uh, in 35 years that many people would, would wish that they've done. I've done it all. Indeed. Uh, you, went, you went public twice. Was, went uh, public twice, once uh, on NASDAQ. Yes. And once here. I mean, we're still yeah. here. That's right. I mean, you did a reverse merger in NASDAQ. And then we did a private equity deal. So yeah. we, were, uh, we were the first private equity of you know, the quintessential private equity deal yeah. with Abraj. So Abraj launched their fund. They acquired us off of NASDAQ, brought us back here, yeah. took us public again three years later on, on the Dubai financial markets. How did that shift things for you? I mean, did it give you more discipline? Did it give you more clarity? Uh, did it, meaning, know, meaning going public? Going, going public initially rather than remaining in, in, yeah, in private going hands. Going public was, was the, what made this company what it is today, so mm -hmm. on NASDAQ. On NASDAQ, yeah. So definitely not, uh, not on any other markets, unfortunately, in the region. Uh, so we continue to run the business as if it was a NASDAQ-listed company. Okay. And uh, so that transparency, adhering to SEC standards, I mean, it made the company, it, the discipline, the reporting, the disclosure, uh, the governance uh, was a massive lesson for us. And you, got, you learn by fire. Because once you're public in the US, you, 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 I mean, you're, uh, you'd better be very careful. And, and because most of our investors were also uh, funds from the US. So as, as much as we wanted to raise money here, yeah. nobody was interested. When we went public on Nasdaq, everybody, everybody. got excited. <laughs> oh, he's, he's legitimate. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. We, uh, we're taking other people's money. <laughs> yeah. uh, moving on to your, your current passion in life, which right. is uh, as the executive chairman of uh, WAMDA. What inspired you to get into that? And what so, are the activities today? Uh, so, um, you know, the, the WAMDA is a digital platform to, that enables uh, entrepreneurs and invests in them at the, uh, in, in the tech space. So uh, if you're a believer that the digital space has arrived, which many people haven't believed in, but it's here, by the way, if you carry your phone. So the digital revolution has arrived in the Arab world, and it's happening. And I'm investing in it. I'm investing in it at a very early stage. So I'm the first check. I have more than 95 companies in my in, 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 that I've invested in over the years. Many of them failed, from, if you had heard uh, the previous talk from, from Karim and others. And uh, we effectively believe, so I'm going to uh, contradict you a little bit from your earlier introduction. I'm not going to be humble. We actually created the industry in the digital space because we invested in it very early on. We were the biggest risk takers. Back from, from the year 2000, when I first invested uh, with Samih and Hussam in Maktoub. In Maktoub, yes. And uh, when people made fun of us, saying, oh, uh, <laughs> you know, web browsers, there is no internet uh, businesses that are going to make it in the Arab world. Why? Because, you know, there is this sense that we are backwards, you know. Yeah. It happens in Silicon Valley, but it cannot happen here because we're, you know, there's something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. So we invested in it. We actually built it. And then Yahoo came and acquired it. And then suddenly, everybody, again, yeah. when the guy from Silicon Valley comes they believe it so when when yahoo came to town we are suddenly you know the industry is happening and uh, happily yes. so uh, i mean I, i'm being a bit cynical but uh, but in the, today in today's world that's my revolutionary sense coming which is, which is great so if 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 uh, uh, if you don't say it as it is uh, the message is boring yeah. uh, so Yahoo comes, acquires uh, Maktoub nine years later, and it takes nine years to 10 years, by the way. Uh, uh, exits will happen after 10 years. OK, for those of you who, are, who will ask, where are the exits? It takes 10 years. And it will take 10 years from 2009. So the industry in this region happened in yeah. 2009 when Yahoo acquired. Why? Because this is the PayPal mafia story. So when PayPal uh, got launched and then got acquired, and, and the Elon Musks of this world, the Reed Hoffmans of this world, went out and built Silicon Valley of the 21st century. Yeah. Maktoub is exactly the same story. So souq.com is a product of Maktoub. The founders are owners of, of, of Souq because lovely Yahoo said to us, we're not interested in Souq. You take it. We're only acquiring the other side of, of uh, Maktoub, and happily, because and you will hear more stories about Souq very, very soon. Uh, and, and, and it became 
you know, the hundred million, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of company created the, the e-commerce uh, industry in the region. And there were about 15 uh, companies that started off of the original Maktoub. So founders left, yes. built businesses. Again, back to the story of failure or back to the story of graduation. You graduate from companies that do well and they're telling us 10 minutes. So, we, uh, so, uh, so the industry happened from there. We, we'll ignore it. <laughs> well, the industry happened from there. It's like a threat. Yes, 10 minutes. Exactly. Go. Speak, um, to, speak fast. Speak fast. Lunch is waiting now. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, I don't mind. So I'm, I'm just teasing. <laughs> just, you. just okay, too. I think the, uh, what you just said, uh, you're a quintessential angel investor. I mean, he's got yeah. big wings. Uh, he has Red Bull every morning and evening. Do you think these people here need Red Bull? Get, become an angel and actually I don't go know if they the... need Red Bull. They definitely need to be angel investors. <laughs> uh, creating jobs of the future. Why is angel investment so important? Uh, because if you don't invest very early on, then, you know, so my, my example always of angel investing is you need to do a lot of them. Uh, and it's like, if you don't have babies, you're not going to have adults. Yes. Okay? So it's not, you know, there are no miracles in yeah. this. There's a bio biological story to it. Yeah. You need to get married, you need to have a baby, yeah. and then that baby becomes an adult and does whatever he does. So it's yeah. the same thing in, in, in startups. You need to invest in a lot of baby startups so yeah. that you can have the souks or the Amazons or the Maktoubs. Or, uh, so the base is massive. Yeah. The base is massive. There are thousands, literally. We alone, as a fund, saw about 700 companies last year mm -hmm. interviewed yeah. for investments. We ended up investing in about 10 last year from these 700. But it's, it's, uh, it, it, somebody needs to give them that first check so that you can validate that idea whether it makes sense or not, or to get them to fail. Because in failure is where we learn. I mean, Silicon Valley is the story, and then again, back to failure. Silicon Valley is the story of saying it sits on the a graveyard of so many startups. Yeah. So many startups. And, and today's boom in, in, in the world of the digital economy sits on the bust of 2000. I mean, most of these startups, uh, either uh, founders either came back in many different phases, yeah. in many different, and, but with experience under their belt. And there's nothing better than actually tinkering and failing uh, uh, than, than to build the next business or the third business. So I would always invest in a failed entrepreneur in his second startup. Right. Because he's, he must have, ha have, have had that. He's, he must have seen the road. One of my definitions of failure, uh, I use the five Fs of failure. Fail fast, fail forward, fail frequently, fail frugally, and, all, and failure is not fatal. Is that something that failure our, is a journey of learning? Of learning. So if is you, that something you take, we need to absorb? But it's not as, only absorb. I mean, if you take failure as a journey to, uh, I mean, if if you think of not making it as a journey in your first round as a journey of learning, then then it's not going to be called failure. It's going to be called a journey of learning. Yes. And then we destigmatize it, yeah. and then take the cultural. Uh, threats of it, because they tell you the Arabs are risk averse. <laughs> don't buy that. I don't buy that don't, at all. Don't believe them. Um, so people take risks. The Arab world is filled with entrepreneurs. Yeah. This not, does it have to be? I mean, the private sector in the Arab world has, has done well for itself over the years. Uh, even though sometimes we, we like to depend on government because it loves us and we, we, it smothers us sometimes. And we love their contracts, and we love oil and gas sometimes, and make money out of oil and gas. But the reality of the matter is that's changing and changing fast. Because, um, uh, I mean, these are Harvard people, so I don't need to preach. <laughs> them, but but in, in, in the digital economy, uh, the entrepreneurs are not taking permission. They don't care whether licenses come up or don't come up. They're going to build their apps, and they're going to disrupt, and they're going to do stuff, and they don't care whether you invest in them or not, because it is a world of permissionless innovation, as my friend Joey Ito says at um, T Media Lab. Yeah. It's cheap yeah. to uh, 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 build a business, yeah. uh, and it is, uh, that's why it's easy to fail. Yeah. And you don't even know, some of the kids that are building apps today don't even know that they're disrupting anything. They're just coming up and, and you know, saying, this, I, I'd like to do this better, and, and they're doing it. So, so it, it, in this sense, my last word on this, experience counts for nothing uh, because there's a new frontier here. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't experienced the digital frontier, uh, you're going to have to worry. 
you don't have to worry. So um, it's the traditional businesses that have suddenly woken up that there is e-commerce in the Arab world that's going to eat our lunch. The retail model is under threat because it didn't grow last year while e-commerce is growing 50%. Yeah. So the people that say people are not buying, they're buying, but they're buying somewhere else. They're, they're buying in New York via Amazon, and they're buying in Dubai via Souk. And uh, you'd better change your model. You'd better either be clicks and bricks, an old story that said clicks and bricks. And, but you need to think very seriously um, about the skills of the people you hire, about how you are selling, about how you're reaching your client. Uh, because the digital world is, is a different platform. It's not about only launching a startup yeah. that sells retail, yeah. uh, e-tail online. Uh, the mall model, it's a big statement for me to say here in Dubai, mm -hmm. is under threat. Okay. It's under threat because yeah. Amazon is coming to town. Right. And Amazon is in the business of disrupting malls. Mm -hmm. So we'd better be careful for that. But al has uh, set up his startup. Ah, I love Muhammad, and he's, he's launching a noon startup. He, he, it's, it's a, it's a billion-dollar startup. But it's a big statement. He's basically yeah. saying, I am, the, I am the bricks and mortar guy that built the tallest building in, in the world. I'm also thinking digital. So he, uh, we'll pay attention to Muhammad Labbar uh, because you know he's a serious guy. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a man that would not announce something when he's not serious about it. Yeah. Uh, and it, it basically says, and he's built the biggest mall. And so it, 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 he basically is saying that I am not going to let uh, this train move uh, when I am in, the, in that business of the 20th century. Right. Uh, we must talk about education, and I know we've had this conversation before. We're at Harvard Business School uh, event. What are, what are your views on the current style and structure of 20th, 18th century uh, education that we have at the moment? But you said 18th century, <laughs> not me. Yes. So I'm, with all due respect to Harvard, and, and we love Harvard, and I'm not a Harvard grad, by the way. So That's why uh, you're doing so well, perhaps. I hire Harvard grads. <laughs> okay. and, um, um, a students uh, and C student, you know that story. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the I'm the latter. I see. Um, so education, what, what what do you want to know? So education is look. I'm, I was bored to death in school. Yeah, literally, literally, yeah. to death. I don't think I remember anything I learned except that I needed to re read books, yeah. which was fantastic that because I read books now and I get my general education and learning. But what do I remember about university? Yeah. Uh, the cafeteria. <laughs> uh, going out. Uh, so I was a revolutionary, so I, and I can't say this because it's so old, they won't throw me in jail. So I was, I was in the demonstration business, right. an Arab student activist okay. with a beard this, uh, this big and hair, and Khomeini took over, and, uh, <laughs> and then Yasser Arafat uh, uh, got ignored, and then Rabin came and shook hands. I was the guy outside you were out doing the bit. Uh, yeah. on, on Lafayette Square because okay. I studied in Washington, D.C., uh, yes. telling uh, Anwar Sadat that, you know, how, how can you ignore the Palestinians? Yeah. Uh, so that's what I learned. Yeah. I learned the freedom of thought. I learned the freedom of speech. I learned the freedom of rebelling. Yeah. I, I learned something very important, by the way, that if you don't, if you don't know how to argue your cause, yeah. it, your cause is a failure. Yeah. So when I went to school in the United States, I came and this was my first exposure uh, to Jews, okay. sorry, uh, sorry, meaning, no, no I'm, I'm not politicizing. I, I had never met a Jew, and then there was this Israeli issue that was facing us, and we felt that the Palestinian cause was a very right cause, but we knew nothing about defending it. So when I first stood on a public discussion to defend the Palestinian cause, I failed. And I was so embarrassed because I didn't know my history properly. I, I knew it in general, but I knew that we had the right cause. But I, I learned that I needed to learn how to defend my cause. That's, that's, that's what I remember about education. And that's what the American education system teaches you. Right. So I mean, you the come full... back with that critical mind that says, I can be an entrepreneur, even though I never knew what entrepreneurship was when I started my business. Yeah. So you need that open mind, uh, critically thinking, uh, challenging, uh, uh, challenging the norms, ch challenging the uh, the, the current status. 
So the four-year. That's what an entrepreneur is. He's a challenger of the status quo, yeah. which is a revolutionary at the end of the day because it, it means the status quo is not working. And so universities, I sit on the American University of Beirut board, yeah. and I am, and I can say it, uh, I am bored with that board. <laughs> I am bored. I just met the president. And I said, look, you want to you wanna engage me? I need to feel that I am making a difference, that this university is going to go to the 21st century, that the classroom is no longer the place where kids are going to learn. When are we going to let them tinker? When are we going to create, for instance, for instance, an internship program in universities? Because uh, a Northwest, Northeastern University has a fantastic program in the US, by the way. Uh, it's not Harvard, with all due respect, but you will not graduate unless you do a year of actual internships. And you know what happens to these people is they become a legitimate, capable people ready for the job market. The current university sits within its walls, specifically in our region. I, you know, the West is trying, and they, you, know, you have the MOOCs, and the MOOCs are challenging everything because uh, in the classroom, the teacher sits and talks at me, and in, in I can, while I can be online, and, and, and it's, it's the pull, it's the pull, not the push. I don't want you to tell me what I need to learn. I want to learn what I want to learn. So if our universities are not going to be in tune with the skills and with the needs of the individual, uh, at, at whatever it is, then, then we are, we're in trouble. So the four-year degree program should be about one year of study and then three years of tinkering, playing, yeah, learning, I mean, experimenting. Because really, I mean, six months after you graduate, uh, unless you're a doctor, I mean, I don't know, and the doctors, if they don't keep the practice, they will lose their knowledge. So imagine the people that study business, I mean, with all due respect to the, uh, to the, to the Harvard Business School. Imagine the people that study business, if they don't practice their business, what do they? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, go. So, I, pro, uh, you spoke about. You learn nothing. Yeah. I, I, you learn nothing. You learn discipline, which right. is important. And critical thinking. But, but I don't know if you're ready for the job market. Yeah. Uh, the beauty about the Harvard Business School is its incredible network. Yeah. It gets me jobs. <laughs> what I love about the announcements of some of the big companies in the US today is that they are taking away from your CV where you graduated from. Yeah. Because that gives you a bias. Because a Harvard grad, with all due respect to Harvard, uh, is interviewing a Harvard grad. And I come from George Washington University. Who's gonna, who is he going to employ? The stupid GW grad or the Harvard grad? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and you know, that's, that's, that's not a fair world. That's yeah. one percenters yeah. killing us all. Yeah. <laughs> But, but, but that's part of that's uh, Harvard, uh, meaning 1%. Absolutely. I mean, uh, <laughs> digital bias and uh, automation bias will starts creeping in, which leads me to the next question, which is on digital ethics. We're talking about a digital revolution here. Yeah. What, what are we looking at in terms of having digi digital ethics, bioethics, so, uh, and all of those digital elements? Digital ethics, meaning uh, having respect to the person that you are tweeting about as if he is standing next to you? No, I, I, that's just, just uh, good. Or are you talking about uh, uh, Trump and his tweets? I'm talking about Trump and his tweets, no. <laughs> because that's fake news. That's fake news, indeed. No, no what I mean by digital, you, we're going into big data. We're the best going thing into... about this is you can talk about Trump here and nobody does anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Let's talk about Trump. I'm, I'm pushing my luck. No, 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 no let's no. not. <laughs> he will tweet about us, so let's not do that. Uh, one of the key things uh, on, on the digital ethics part, which I'll be talking about later, was that big data is becoming bigger and bigger, and artificial, so artificial intelligence, intelligence is becoming so powerful that what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis is going to affect us. So you're supporting the digital environment in our region. Uh, yeah. Are we actually aware and conscious and cognizant of We'd this kind be. of fear, uh, of this be. kind of re risk, rather? We'd better be, because we, live it, we, we experience it every day, by the way. Even if you buy on Amazon today, you will get a recommendation from Amazon that says, you bought this, why don't you buy this and do that? And then on Facebook, if you search for a product, suddenly Facebook starts telling you, here, why don't you buy this? And it's like, and they used to, have, they used to hear your voice, and then they were done, by the way. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so digital ethics is like what sort of jobs do we have in the future? Is artificial intelligence and, and robotics are going uh, gonna to take over uh, people's jobs? Is machine learning going to be doing all sorts of things? Yes, there are. There are businesses that are going to be challenged and, uh, and challenged big time uh, because, uh, because of it. But there are other jobs that are going to be created. So Kareem, even though they're talking about driverless cars, uh, it, it will uh, are, have 180,000 people maybe in their, uh, in their driving, uh, in their captains. They call them captains. In Saudi Arabia, I mean, just uh, uh, you might have mentioned it earlier, in Saudi Arabia, 75% of the Kareem captains are Saudis. Yeah which challenges all the cultural, whoever sold us that culture that Saudis or Arabs don't want to do jobs that are not necessarily behind desks, are basically uh, li have been lying to us all these years. Because once the opportunity came and the guy felt that he was a micro entrepreneur and actually making a living from driving people from one place to another, he actually went out and said it, even though if he's, he's um, and many of, the, of, their, of their employees, by the way, have degrees from universities, which means uh, you know, when the job pays, People will actually take it. So, but on the digital side of things, we are we are challenged. The challenge is going to happen in the West probably before us. Yeah. So we uh, learn from that and, yeah. and, and take it from there. And 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 so one thing I'd like to say is, the guy that heads uh, robotics department at Stanford University mm -hmm. is uh, Osama Al Khatib. He's a Syrian who went to Stanford in the 80s. I bet you many of you don't know. He is the the king of robotics in the world. Mm -hmm. And he is, I just saw him recently at Stanford, and you should go to the Stanford Robotics Lab. We, we need to be, it's a big challenge, yeah. uh, what happened, uh, what's happening in robotics, and, and, and coupled with machine learning and coupled with artificial intelligence. I'm not a techie as such, I invest in tech. Mm -hmm. But that's space that uh, one needs to really worry about. Yeah. Let's open uh, to a couple of questions. I have one final question with you, and we will end with that. A uh, couple of questions, please. Well, thank you very much. I, I need you to identify yourself, please. Uh, Dr. Mariam al Swedi. Uh, I'm a loyal customer to Aramex. You are, you are from, from the Emirates? You, yeah, UAE. I'm a loyal customer for Aramex. Loyal? Good. Yeah. I hope for, they're loyal back to you. Yeah, that's the that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> OK, I'm a regular user of Shop and Ship. Yes. Uh, I was voted number three in Abu Dhabi, so you number better be- Number three buyer on Shop and Ship? <laughs> yes. Or oh, e-commerce is happening. Yes. Yeah. Well, I enjoy um, shopping at home. I find it more relaxing. Uh, so uh, there is an increase in your price lately. So do you think that it is justifiable, especially with the global, you know, slowdown? You know, and everything. With the best thing about your question is I no longer run Aramex, by the way. So <laughs> yeah. I, but you, you would understand. I'm going to talk to them about No, no, you would understand uh, the kind of, I mean, what are the criteria? Did they, why they're uh, doing I, this? I, I, let me criticize my, my old company. Thank you. And tell you if they don't face the reality of the digital disruption and the needs of changing their cost structures and delivery structures because of the e-commerce boom. They're going to have problems. Let me very quickly yeah, no, please, please. Uh, tell you what's happening in e-commerce. Historically, people bought from places. So you would go to the marketplace and buy and go back home. E-commerce basically flipped that uh, around. So it is uh, you sit at home and you want the world to come to you. That has completely killed, completely killed the logistics industry because we were built differently. We were not built to come to your home to deliver packages. Amazon had six billion packages last year alone. I was one of them. Yeah. None, <laughs> none of the traditional FedExes, Aramexes, UPSs of this world are capable of handling the requirements that e-commerce is doing because we are clogged. We were not built like that. And that's why you see Amazon doing its own thing today and saying, I'm going to deliver in two hours. So uh, Aramex today, because it was the first company to recognize e-commerce in the region, it built that infrastructure. But today, we cannot. We cannot. I'm telling you, we cannot handle the amount of business that we get. One reason of that here in the Gulf is the inflexibility, that's another discussion, yes. <laughs> of the labor markets. Because if I wanted to go flex today, if I want to go and say I need to hire 3,000 people on a part-time basis in season, in season in Saudi Arabia. It's illegal. <laughs> so when, when Souk gives me hundreds of thousands of packages over Ramadan, what do I tell Souk? What do I tell them? I can't deliver. 
because I don't have the employees for it, because I'm not going to build my employee base based on seasons, and the world lives around seasons in e-commerce. So what happens is you get 10-day delivery times, and Aramex gets slapped all the time, because they can't deliver. So the flex if you want to create jobs in Saudi Arabia, have a flex job market, because how that's the world is moving into that. Thank you. You Did I trashed, answer your question? You, you haven't trashed the banks yet. Uh, they don't lend money. I, I was at a, at a Financial Times event this morning, and I did that completely. And so I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're on a, So, so, can so you... I'm, I am. I, I don't know if there are bankers here, but in that one, there were plenty of those. So, and they hate me now. So, uh, so uh, fintech is going to eat their lunch. They're not supporting the SMEs. Nobody not wants the startups. to go to a bank anymore. Here's here's my bank. <laughs> yes. So yeah, absolutely. The bank doesn't. A quick question, this. Mustafa. Then we wrap up. Uh, hi, Mustafa again, passion guy. Thank you, Fadi. Uh, what's, what's the way for companies to handle the risk, which is obvious, of the globalization in the tech? Because now you're talking about retailers. You don't have to buy from suit.com. You buy from Amazon. You buy from anywhere else in the world. The company that's set up somewhere, manufacturing in India, using any it's company. More than to this do. World. There's, there's, and, there's, and robotics, now you're talking about you know, drones and all of this no, doing nobody. the delivery. Yeah. How are you going to capitalize, you as in anybody here, capitalize on this opportunity and mitigate well, the I'm, risk? Well, I'm that? investing in it. But what I'm telling traditional businesses that are there, that you're the way, look, businesses and businessmen in the Arab world, and I was one of them, uh, it got chubby and close to government. Uh, Rafiq Hariri, bless his soul, the ex-prime minister of Lebanon, we met with him once as, as something called the Arab Business Council, whatever. And we told him, look, you need to help us open markets and uh, have free trade and movement. You know what he told us? He says, the worst people that are protectionists in the Arab world are who? It's not the regulator. It's the business community that doesn't want to compete. So they, he said, you, you guys are hypocrites, effectively. You're building the walls, and you're telling me now to break them down. If you want to compete, go improve your products effectively and compete with the global products. So what the digital economy is doing to all of us, and God bless Amazon and the rest of them, is that they're getting us to shape up. We either sell with them, we either improve our products, because no one is going to protect us. The world, is, uh, despite Trump's wars, despite Trump, uh, you know, global trading wars, and he's just stopped airlines from flying to the United States by, by creating this false impression that if you ship, uh, if you have your iPad with you, then everything is danger, that he doesn't want Emirates Airlines and that they had to fly to the US. That's, that's his protectionism. Despite that, <laughs> despite that, despite that, uh, uh, and, and, and look how they got scared from the, the competition that comes from the Arab world. Because if it was the other way around, and I'm changing the subject, because if it was the other way around, <laughs> That's the activist if it was American, That's American the Airlines flying into the region, and we suddenly throw protectionism at them, what would they do? They'd say we're backwards. I'm sorry. You know, this is, it's an unfair world, but we're going to fight it anyway. We're done, man. Look, uh, uh, Tariq. Tariq, if you keep me here, I'm big. somebody's going to like, throw me off. No. So, uh, <laughs> let's finish. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is a closed, please, this is please, a closed room. Let's end, let's end this misery. And <laughs> uh, while you're ahead, no, no, uh, a couple of quick questions. I mean, I know we are late for lunch, and I've been getting uh, the look and the push and the nudge and everything. Do we have time for another couple of questions, or you want to close this thing? Yes? One? OK. Ma'am, feed the mind. Feed the mind. Uh, I'm, I'm hungry, actually. So. <laughs> 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 I, I have uh, a lot of questions, but one, one question. Yeah. yeah, I will tell, I will one tell question. only one. Yeah. So you're telling that you're supporting a lot of startups and innovation and uh, just I am, I, Yeah, that's what I do. So uh, My I'm second sure, career. Yeah, you started with second exactly. career. Second so, career. I'm sure on a daily basis you face a lot of interesting people who comes with innovations daily. and offers and everything. So what is the key factor you choose says, yes, I'm going to invest in this business? Because I'm sure the number of innovations is crazy. Thank you. Key factors in choosing the, the company that I invest in? Yeah. So the, there are several key factors, but I, well, this, you must have heard it before. So we look at the team. We don't like single, single, single founders unless they're, I mean, I don't know, Harvard grads. Um, uh, we, <laughs> that was not serious. So uh, we, we like teams. Uh, we like to see their traction. Uh, we like 
clearly to see their passion. If he starts talking to me about exits, I'm not going to invest in him because I have zero interest in anybody thinking of his exit. I like entrepreneurs who are building businesses. I'm in the exit business because I'm, a, I'm an investor. So I need to exit. But the entrepreneur does not need to think exit. So I, I look at character. I look at grit. I look at his understanding of his place. I look at his passion. Is he, does, he, does he really want to do this? Does he get the industry he's getting in? I mean, the guys, I, I like to talk about Kareem. Uh, Ronaldo Mshahwar from Souk and Kareem, uh, founders Mudassar and Magnus are just incredible people. They are, for instance, the Kareem founders talk to you. They want to actually create the company that is going to make a difference in the world. And they want to do it through whatever Kareem does. And they're, they're, they're clearly building the passion and, and, and uh, Thank clearly you. building the attraction. And Any question from this side? So that's what we do. All right. Uh, well, last question there, ma'am, and then we go for lunch. Quickly, make it count. Everybody's waiting. And, and please identify yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Suad. I work in education. Now in, in where? Well, I send students abroad. So many students, they don't want to go abroad. They want to do it online, you know, work and study. And it's like shopping online, you know, studying online. It's the same, but it's not allowed. It's so, not allowed? No. Yeah, because we have, you know, again, the education ministries are so powerful that they impose on us on this thing that they have to certify our, uh, yeah. our uh, certificate, whatever we get, the, the university degree that we get. And it has to be from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, stamped in triplicate, sent back home. <laughs> but that's because you want to work in government. Because if you don't want to work in government, I assure you, in the private sector, we care less about your degree. We will not interview you based on your degree. That is only a question out of 10 questions, 100 questions. And mostly, we employ on character. We employ on inquisitiveness. We employ on, on on going out and solving. Uh, if you have a degree from a fantastic university and you are boring, you're not going to get employed. <laughs> Finish. My, uh, my final question, uh, and to wrap it all up, because uh, we spoke about business, but you're also a social entrepreneur. You make yes. such a difference on the social side. And for all the people here, the balance so between I'm, the social I'm, element. There's, there's, I am a great believer that businesses will succeed in successful societies. Look at our brothers and sisters in Syria. Successful societies will create a, a, the business people. Yeah. So they're all in exile today. Yeah. So that's a there are political reasons there. But, uh, and we've, we, we look at Yemen, look at, 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 look at countries that, look at Egypt for that matter. If society is miserable, uh, don't celebrate your success as a business, because you're not going to last. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then we need to start moving away very clearly from this lousy reputation that we have as business people, as being greedy, we don't care about society, we don't invest in society. And let's demolish completely the concept of corporate social responsibility yeah. and CSR. Because it's about PR. And I'll bet you most of these companies that actually do CSR have it in their PR Your department. Yeah. So CSR equals PR, dead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you are not activists in the sense that you are active in your society, that you are making a difference in your society, that you are employing because the well-being of society is good, that you're not going to celebrate a company that fires 1,000 people and go buy their shares because their income will improve because they fired 1,000 people, then you are ethical. And then you become a corporate uh, uh, responsible in society as a whole. Because if we think corporations live in societies and our employees are the sons of daughters of society, then what do we do? Do we destroy society while we have their daughters and sons with us? Yeah. So you need to be an activist in that sense. So uh, I'm, I'm, this is not too revolutionary, by the way. I'm just passionate and loud. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't matter. Ignore that <laughs> sound. It, it requires you to be a little bit more sensitive uh, about society and a little bit more compromising on the, your profits once in a while. It doesn't hurt. You know, Aramex in the financial crisis did not fire a single employee. Our revenue went down 10%. We never have ever fired employees. 
So, uh, uh, and thank you for that. And thank you for that. And, and maybe the markets would have accepted that. And maybe we could have taken an opportunity and say, let's fire people because everybody expects you to fire. But we did not fire. Ladies and gentlemen. And we're doing better now. So let's go. That's uh, quintessential. Thank you very much.